So hello, sorry for being the last one. So be brave, uh, despite my accent, because you know when you have an Italian who lives in France, you can put together two bad accents. So it's a terrible thing. It's normal in English, but I will try to say something interesting to keep you alive. And I will try to talk today about passenger path decision on complex transport networks, or how to challenge maps design between traveler's perception and operational constraints. So what will I say? Uh, I have divided the presentation in five parts. I'll start showing you that SNCF is not, not only a railway company, and so why we are interested in uh, natural maps. Then I will try to look to the link you have today between transport and cities, things uh, I mean you normally know, but I'll try to point two or three uh, very important points for us. I will talk about actors and attractors that you can find around network maps, and then talk about complexity. Uh, I had in my ears a lot of things uh, that I heard uh, today and yesterday, and I think this complexity is shared, so we can find on the last part of the presentation, we can try to find a way to go through this complexity all uh, together. So, why a group like SNCF is interested in complex transit maps? Well, it's really simple in, uh, in reality because a, lo a lot of you probably knows uh, SNCF as a railway operator, so a French railway company. But in reality, during the last 10 years, the group changed a lot. So we have uh, to date uh, 2017 data, uh, 33 0.5 billion euros of revenue, and a third of it is made outside France, and almost a third of it is made in public urban networks. So we are less and less a railway company, and more and more a public transport company. And just to give you uh, some elements, some numbers, we uh, have the possibility to have 14 million persons who daily travels with us all over the world, under the SNCF, or mainly the Keolis brand. And if I had to give you some places in which people travel with us, obviously you will have a great part of main uh, France agglomeration. So Lyon, uh, Bordeaux, uh, Paris, obviously, in uh, where we are present in uh, Ariar, and uh, the totality of the uh, suburban uh, train networks, but also Lille, for example. So a lot of friends, but if we go a little bit uh, further, we can find a part of Northern Europe in which, for example, the two main uh, operating urban networks are a part of the uh, London urban networks, in particular the um, Docklands Light Railway and uh, Copenhagen. And if we go farther, we can find a lot of cities around the world, uh, of which I can recall Wuhan in China, Washington, for example, is the, the bus in Washington, Montreal, Las Vegas, bus to Boston, Bergen, and so on. So complex networks are extremely important for us, and they'll be more and more important in the coming years. So we are starting to analyze the link between transport and cities and in particular, the role of network maps in a digital era. And so, when we start looking at something which is new for us, obviously, we start from history. And we started from a book who originated in some sort of wayfinding. It's the image of the city of Kevin Lynch in the 60s. Uh, and Lynch said that every city produces a mental representation of itself among its inhabitants and visitors. And these representations consist in the ability to recognize its key elements and organize them into a coherent scheme. So you can see this moment in the 60s as the birth of the notion of wayfinding and at the same time the birth of the notion of imageability, which is intended as a global and shared mental representation. And so, which for me is extremely interesting, that the city is produced by its given image, so it's a sort of performative creation of the city. And two notions start 
having a great importance at the moment. The first one is the cognitive representation of the city. So you have a physical city and you have a cognitive city. And it's iconicity. And iconicity means the birth of urban marketing. So extremely important too. And at the same time, this complexity, this exploding complexity, goes from network growth to calculations and calculators. Because, and someone asked for that yesterday, are we still able, from a cognitive point of view, to manage the information that is required to make a decision in public uh, transport networks? Well, the, the answer arrived from a mathematical point of view in 2016 in a paper of Galotti, Porter, and Batalemi, and the answer is no. In great urban areas like Paris, London, and Tokyo, it's cognitively impossible for a man to manage the information if we share with him the totality of the information and the, of choices we had and he had about the networks. So we assist today to new uses and new tools that are built to help people manage the networks. And in particular, we start from the most uh, simplest things, route planning in the same mode, and then we can add complexity and arrive to multimodal route planning with high and low capacity modes or collective or individual transport solution. Then we can complexify it more than this and going from A to B, so start point, end point, with a complex route planning, considering uh, different and additional factors, like urban factors. And obviously, we assist today to some changes in usages because of the role of interactive planning tools, which shows us the need to take into account their impact in terms of behavior and of cognitive human abilities. So if we talk about tools, we can ask what is a good planning tool for people. So I can say that we have different elements to take into account. First of all, we have to consider the criteria to calculate a route for a traveler. So it could be rapidity, cost, walkability, the risk, different kind of risk. You can risk of losing a connection. You can have a risk not to exceed to a specific place. You can also take other elements like comfort, for example, in our analysis. After that, we will have to work about the trust in it. So how we could be uh, sure that the transport operator could manage transport disruption, for example, or give us an update real-time information. Also, we want to be reinsured about the information which is given to us. And so, uh, a good planning tool will help people to be oriented, and uh, at the same time, it will help people erasing the doubts, the fears, and arrive in some ways to anchor daily journeys along the emergence of stabilized habits. And also, a point which is not related to transport, but which is extremely important for people, we, uh, a good tool will help people appropriate the city. They are living it or they are visiting it. And so the combination of these different factors is always unique, situated, and personal. So some elements which could be interesting to take into account uh, rely on perception. And which is important with human beings is that normally we rely more on external information, more than on our feelings. So if I take some, uh, some recent papers in a psychology domain principally, we can show that, for example, network maps would be one of the most important sources of information for planning, and notably the first for people who don't know the networks. This is a work by Zekin, 2008. But also, I take London as an example. When asked to draw the British capital, Londoners would rely more on the tube map than on geographical map of the city. This is a work by Bertesi, always 2008. And then also the distance between two points on a transport scheme 
would influence route planning twice as much as the actual distance between these two points. And finally, in an experiment, uh, most, more recent, it was 2015 on the Ducklam uh, Light ro Railway, uh, Roberts and Rose highlighted that different version of a network schema can dramatically change user behavior, including route choices. So all these studies point a strong gap between network maps and the topographical perception of concerned cities. And I think here we touch an extremely important point. What is a, di a diagram? What is a network map? And I go looking for something uh, I was used to read when I was uh, in, uh, in semiotics at the university, which is, uh, I take a citation of Charles Sanders Peirce, the um, American pragmatist uh, philosopher, who talked about diagrams. Mm -hmm. And he said that all deductive reason even sample syllogism involves an element of observation, namely deduction consists in constructing an icon or diagram of the relation of whose parts show, uh, shall present a complete analogy with those of the parts of the object of reasoning, of experimenting upon this image in the imagination and of observing the results so as to discover unnoticed and hidden relation amongst the parts. So I take natural maps as diagram in a Persian sense, and therefore as signs whose parts have the same internal relations as the operational elements of a transport network between them. So in this case, network maps could be intended not as representation, but as signs who represent possible real action for travelers. So talking about network maps is not talking about a, a graphic uh, schema is not talking about an image, it's talking about making things and normally making transport go to, from A to B. But what are those relations? What is the, the, the central relation? Well, we can say that a good network diagram is, has to be an iconic diagram. So it must represent action to use public transport and achieve mobility. So reassuring and making sense of it. Then it is stable over time and available in all circumstances. But it also builds a common ground for everyday life of citizens. And finally, it hierarchizes structures and presents a vision of territory. But, and this is the question of today, I think, of multiplicity. How could an iconic diagram exist today in a time of conflict and multiplicity. It was easier before when you have only one actor, but now you have a lot of actors, you have a lot of medias, you have a lot of technologies. So how could it work? And so I decided to have a little look of this conflict and of this mediation we can find today uh, around natural diagrams, obviously seen from the, the eyes of an operator. And obviously, the first actors we had in this context are the travelers, which have some specific needs. A traveler wants just to know how to get from A to B in the simplest way, his personal simplest way, so the fastest or the more comfortable, and so on. He wants to be aware of the main alternatives to connect A to B, the main alternatives, not necessarily all the alternatives. He wants to be reassured when using public transport. He wants to learn and use network maps and more generally planning tool in a simple way. And he wants to also be helped during wayfinding process to live this experience in a simple and immediate way. So he has certain interests, which are different, obviously, from the interests that public transport authorities could have. And PTA wants normally to present all modes and the global transport services at a metropolitan or a regional scale. They want to structure and prioritize between modes. They want to attract the largest number of travelers to public transport and to attract the greatest number of travelers off peak hours. Why off peak hours? Because of a new fundamental need, which is money. Because the exponential augmentation 
of the networks caused an exponential augmentation of costs in dense networks. And so it's extremely important today to identify levers to maximize capacity while limiting costly infrastructural improvements. So it's easier to explain people or to push people to travel outside and off peak hours than build new rails, buy new trains, and so on. So two actors. And we have obviously the third one, the transport operator, like SNCF, like RTP, which have different kind of interests. First of all, we all, I think, want to overlay transport and city representation to appropriate, in some ways, this richness through the transport networks. And I think that we have said during these two days, imagine to have Paris without RTP. Imagine to have TfL without London. The two will lose a lot. So it's important for the operator to be a part of the city. They also want to give meaning to the networks, to structure them for travelers, obviously, and to make them visible and therefore cognitively manageable. And they also want to balance network operation. So they want to spread passengers between alternative lines, reassure them, and guide them during the urban wandering. So three actors. And we have the fourth one. It's composed by urban and tourism actors. So they want to improve access to public transport to ensure their, their visibility. They want to encourage business and tourism. They want to conduct public policies, for example, walking or cycling, noise reduction, and so on. And they also sometimes want to defend very local, very specific interests, sometimes getting lost in a sort of electioneering uh, vision. So four, but it's not finished. The table, it's big, so we have more people on this around network maps. We will have commercial actors of two different kinds, physical and digital. We have classical physical actors who historically know the importance of appearing, of being present on the representation of the city in order to be known and thus being able to benefit from the related commercial spin-off. But also we have new digital actors who acquire today the right to bring visibility to physical one, to an increasingly large public and can thus allow them to sell a sort of control of their attendance. And also, this is also extremely important, digital actors shape new and per pervasive worldwide standards for transport and urban representation because before every urban network has his own identity and now the connectivity you have and this pervasive use of internet and application and the platform effect you can have in it will change things at a global scale. And finally, we have designers, obviously, a lot of designers in the, in the room. And a designer has a double, may, uh, a double aim. He wants to help travelers to find their way around and do it in the best condition. He wants to create, implement, and deploy a solid and consistent graphical vision. But also wants to give a functional object an aesthetic aim representative of the present time. But a designer, a good designer, is not limited to the present. He also wants to link his work with the school, the, with the tradition who exists. He wants to perpetuate it and renew it. And we had one, two, or three actors who normally are not around the table, sort of, sort of forgotten actors, but which are extremely important too. The first one, I think, is efficacy. Normally, and I think we had uh, a good example from Yo yesterday about this five minutes uh, of the color, uh, the color uh, bus who could disappear in, uh, during a meeting. So decision, and transport, and concerning transport networks are too often subjective. So it's an aesthetic vision, it's a political vision, it's a commercial vision. It's not a vision which is construct about a proven efficacy. We also have the, a lot of usage of surveys who are often uh, uniquely related to verbalization of travelers. 
But we know today in science that to say, to say it sometimes doesn't mean to do it. So having feedback from people saying that this version is better than the other one is not necessarily true about the way they use it. And we have a global big lack of empirical data. So between two, three, four, five different versions of a network maps, which is the better one in terms of error rate uh, while we try to planify uh, itineraries, which is the mean search time to find point A and point B, and so on. Uh, which is strange in some ways, or not, it depends on how you look at the things, is that us experts, we have showed in history a sort of almost complete inability to predict the results of objective performance measurements. So I think about designers, graphic or UX designers, public transport experts and operators. We think that do that would create effect A and normally it's B, the result. So there are a lot of difficulties that have been highlighted in recent work and will ask for us to take differently this question of uh, measuring to have a scientific vision of uh, the usage of network maps. And also two other elements almost forgotten, which are from one side culture. So we have to consider the cultural dimensions of science, the power of representation on human behavior, and finally the cognitive habits of travelers, and also the uh, different limitation and possibilities that technology will give us. So uh, I chose yesterday uh, some images about uh, our world, the SNCF world, and for people who uh, were used to, uh, to be in France, you can find a lot of elements. And if I ask for people who knows the country, if this, which is a screen you find in the station, it's for departures, or arrival, normally, you know it. So this is for, and this? Well, I'm not sure you can arrive to read here between the lines, you have the words, but you're used to it. And the same way, if you find some blue elements, normally, you know, it's information, it's not advertising, and so on. So this is, cultural elements, it exists between you, it's not an essence of property, it's shared knowledge. And also, there are things we cannot do with this kind of technology, but we can do it with this one or this one, inversely. So it's extremely important to take into account these elements too. And so, after showing the different actors uh, we had today around the table, I will try to show the patchwork of maps we have today and find to try to find a way to pass through them. Because we were here at the beginning. We had paper. We had a sort of allocentric representation, a schematic representation, without time. But as uh, we have shown in the last presentation, we project time on it. So if you are in Paris and you're used to the Paris uh, metro network maps, normally you know that going from station one to station two, it's something around two minutes, two to three minutes. And when you go outside Paris, it changes. And if you think that you can walk, because normally in Paris you have a distance between station of 300 meters, something like that, well, it could be not a good idea because you can walk for five kilometers before finding your place. Well, it's not uh, Shanghai yet, but not so comfortable. And this, we know it. We start work about it. But we have new things. We have what I call screen. Screen is at your home with your computer, for example. You have allocentric representation, so geographical, normally allocentric representation, but you have the possibility to interact with your network plans. 
and also you can have real-time information. And the situation can be more complex than this. In the third case, you have a screen, but the screen is mobile. So your smartphone, for example. Here you have real-time, you have interactive information, but you have two different kinds of representation. You have allocentric representation and egocentric representation at the same time. So we still more complex. So we decided to work from the old man network maps, which is in our pockets at the station and on board. And we decided to use uh, a case that arrived in late uh, 2018 because we had on the south of the RRD uh, line a change in services because this was a, uh, what can I say, it's a hill line. We had uh, a lot of problem uh, with the service, a lot of problem in the south, which goes well, the, on the north part of the line. So the north part, it's a good one. It works well, but a lot of problem in the south can provoke some problems in the north. And so we decided to cut it into Normally, you arrive before directly from Paris on the north and you change here in Juvisy, which is you are obliged to do now before you can, you had the possibility to go directly to Malzerbe or on the other side to uh, Melan. And to reduce disruption, we started stopping trains here. So if you arrive from Paris, you have a choice to go directly to corbeil essonne and if you want to go to the terminus of Malzerbe or uh, Melan, you are obliged today to change here to go to Malzerbe or here to go to Melan. And so with this and more than this, with another element that obviously you see here, you have two possibilities now to go from A, Jovisi, to B, corbeil -Esson. And people normally choose the west path. So the west path is more crowded than the east one. And we decided to try by modifying the network maps to balance the two lines. And so we start playing with it. We designed eight, uh, seven different uh, vision of this. I will show you later the first uh, results. We could uh, augment the ratio between the two, so going west, it's longer. It appears to be longer, 20% longer, 40% longer. We can complexify the change in, uh, in Jovisi. We can create a sort of acute angle here. We could also make a straight a vertical line here and so on. And we wanted to see how people react about that. And the results are quite interesting. So just for, for information, we've taken 250 participants. We printed the network on the same size they will find in station. And they, we play with a different uh, design. So here we can find the first uh, results. This is the control. So it's the actual situation. And you can see the percentage of East choices, which is, uh, if my mind is, well, uh, 84. And we have some condition in which people choose to go East more than the others. So we have vertical directness, which is uh, vertical is here. Directness must be this one. 20%, we have 6% people choosing to go east more than the control version in the 20% version. And we also see that when the choice is too complex, things could be not so well. Because here, we complexify the change in Juvisy to try to explain people that change in the next station will be easier because the station is smaller. So you can change in a small station and not in a big one. But the representation was graphical, graphically 
apparently too complex. So we had a great number of errors in planification and people doesn't like it uh, a lot. So what we find is that we had the possibility to take 6% of people from one line directly to the other one without intervening on the, on the infrastructure, for example, just modifying this. But obviously, this would be good if other tools would not exist. So this is a starting point for us. And now we think that we have to go far than this. And so the idea for us, for us is that today we are only at the beginning of this work and we have to learn to master and make current tools to adapt behavior and to operate smoother networks. So we have to start work about what people do at home, so in real-time interactive allocentric representation, in which we have also diagrammatical roadmap here, but we have geographical background who could change choices of people. And we also have personalized options, which are not present, obviously, in network maps. And also, we have to, uh, to attack the problem in mobility. In mobility, you have your own personal Swiss knife with you. So you have a four dimension tools, three dimension and time. You have an action based diagram to be accomplished. It's just a list of action you had there. You have an egocentric view of mobility. So this is your orientation, for example. And so you produce a mixed complex uh, cognitive background with geographical and schematic information at the same time, with allocentric and egocentric point of view at the same time. And also, last but not least, these are normally and mainly made by non-transport actors having a new user-centered vision of commuting, but no transport transportation constraints, which is a big problem for us today. So we think that today it is possible to work on the behavior of people to try to go to an operational optimum and not limit ourselves to individual good. But how could we build the tools to do that? Well, if I had to say something for the tools uh, for tomorrow, for transport, I'll say that we assist today to a multiplication of support of actors and we face a limitation of resources. So media are multiplicated, actors too. We still have a progressive growth and complexification of networks and increased interfaces between modes and exponential increase of costs to gain capacity at peak hours. So SNCF consider that a behavior regulation in order to obtain collective improvements becomes in interesting today to guarantee good operations. So somewhere in the world, people are doing the same things. You have some, uh, I call it directive examples uh, in China in which you have to do things that way or you are not allowed to take the metro or you just disappear, it depends. And you have in the democratic countries, the nudge, for example, or nudge intervention in public spaces, but just to, just to say that it is possible to modify behavior, but we have to find the right way to do that. And the right way is the one who show people the effect probably of their action and will be able to uh, attack and take uh, conscience of the uh, ethical questions about intervening on people's behavior. So for example, behavior regulation requires the awareness of travelers. So SNCF, in specifically in, um, in the Parisian region, we had a third of our delays that are caused by people who will not people get off the train. A third, it's a big part of our delays. So we have to try to find a solution, for example, to, let, to explain that letting people get off in the train is to being able to board more rapidly and so have smooth networks. But also we have to recall that 
build an efficient schema is the goal we had to have and not build a schema getting a certain effect. We have not effects that are better than the others. So we have to try to produce something which is efficient and not to produce this particular effect or this other one. We also have to pay attention to bias produced by studying given population and we have to maintain diversity because humans are different and so which will work for the one will probably not work for the other. And we have to be careful not to reduce the complexity of human behavior while modeling this for the tools we are building it. And, and I will close on this. I think it's the time to build something new, to build new platforms, to build new alliances. So putting network operation and collective good in the spotlight for all the actors around transport. So we will propose an open board for dynamic regulation of multimodal complex network representation and the action to do this, to start this work, is at the beginning to share travelers' needs and knowledge. It's a thing that is not yet so common between authorities, operators, uh, researchers, and so on. It's extremely important to build shared languages. So the cultural dimension is being extremely important. We have to use the same elements not necessarily the same graphical elements, but if we represent the restrooms in having the, the same elements than other operators, despite graphical difference, it will be easier for people to find it, to find restrooms. We also have to promote open platforms. And also, and I think this also emerges, uh, emerges um, to three times or four times during these two days, we have to take externalities into account. For example, building and applying shared scenario and real-time intervention strategies for disrupted situation for all actors, because a modification on a platform of an online actors could modify the role of operators of transport. So we can have too many people in a lapse of time which will not allow us to pull them in the train to go somewhere else. And so we could have risks, we could have costs, and so on. So to conclude, I think that tomorrow transport operations will be an open collaboration and not a simple transport operator or an exclusively data affair. So in this way, I think that representation and diagrammatical maps could be at the heart of this future. And I'm very glad to be today here with you because I help that uh, I hope, sorry, you will help us build on it. So, thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting report on your empirical study of the uh, eight different versions of the change in the map. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the, one of the bar charts indicated a 20% increase in the length of the journey moved only 6% of the passengers. And I'm wondering, as this is a face-to-face -face test, did you ask some passengers why they'd be willing to still take a much longer journey time? Um, and my, my other question was the the bar at the far right, does that indicate a 40% increase in journey time? Uh, and yet it doesn't shift the, uh, the number of uh, riders very much. Normally it, it reduced it. If you see, you are here probably. Not one, this next one. Here. Here you are at 90%. 90 here you are at 85. So and here you are at 84. So the thing we found was uh, for us at the beginning strange. We still have not a clear answer to it. But when we augmented the, the ratio of 20%, we have an effect, which is quite interesting. Augmenting it to 40% doesn't work. Why? 
we have different explication for that. The first one is to say that when the difference between the two, it's I guess this one, is uh, too high, people could prefer the comfort of not changing train. So I will stay on my train, take longer maybe, but I'm quiet. I have not to make a change, for example. This is uh, an hypothesis. The, the other one is that you can have a conflict between schematic representation and geographical uh, knowledge. So you could suspect, in some ways, that things doesn't work so well. So the representation could be not optimal, could be not good, could be not true. So you can decide to, to be on your, on your train. And also, we have uh, another element which doesn't appear in this first uh, descriptive uh, result, which is the, the number of errors people made. And what surprised us, well, well, two elements. The first one, that's using this kind of network max. Uh, we still have a lot of errors. So we take the official uh, network max for the Parisian region. We uh, erased all the bus to simplify it. So we just have the uh, trains uh, and metros and RER. And we have something like 20 to 24 percent of errors on planification, which is enormous. I think it would be interesting to make the same things with the bus. It could be something around a third, maybe more, which is extremely important. You know, people had all the time they want to do that. And the, the other elements, it's probably when the schema you have uh, in front of you is too complex. You could have new rules that arrive. And so your decisions are modified. So until it, the things are simple, which assists to a sort of amelioration following the results we have in literature. When it becomes too complex, here, here, or here, probably we had other effects that we want today to, uh, to analyze and to make more work about this subject, try to understanding what precisely is, is happening. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, sorry, um, I didn't. Uh, I d this is very interesting, and uh, just for me to 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 reiterate because I didn't 100% understand it. So, did I understand it right that uh, you were trying with uh, better communication, with better representation on the map, uh, make people choose more towards a more convenient option or towards a more inconvenient option uh, when you were dealing with this capacity issue that you were telling about? Uh, it depends. What do you mean by more convenient? Or uh, uh, it's uh, a question time, of time. 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 time is the same. Time is the same. Yeah. Same okay. time and same frequency between the two. And the people were choosing, uh, I initially, people were choosing to change trains on the latter interchange, not on the former. And not on the first interchange, but on the second interchange, initially, well, before, the, before the study. Uh, b before the study, the situation was different because you normally didn't had need to change. Yeah. You arrived from Paris, from the north. If you want to go to Malzerbe, you take your train, you have one train or one train or two and make that. Okay. And if you want to go the other side, you arrive from Paris, you made a train ah, and okay. go that way. But this is the new situation. Uh, this new situation has nothing to do with that walk. It's just a question of regularity online to yeah, right. uh, have a better service. And you're now obliged to change here or here if you want to go here and here. So you have to change somewhere. This is an obligation. Yeah. And we just want to see if people prefer, as today, the west line than the east one. And if we have a way 
to balance the two because effectively we had the same uh, number of trains per hour between the two and it's almost the same time between the two. Okay, so now they prefer the west line and uh, your hypothesis was that this is uh, this can be uh, adjusted with the, another way of communicating. Another representation. And uh, do these two in uh, to to which extent these two interchanges are different in terms of convenience of changing trains? You said one station is large, another one is small, but walking distance, amount of stairs. Did you did you take into account the, the these factors? Yeah, uh, I've not presented the results here because we have. Uh, not enough data to give a real answer uh, yet. But you have today two possibilities uh, when you want to use the north change. You can change in Juvisy, which is a pretty big uh, station. It's a complex hub. And you can change in uh, Viry, which is a smaller one. And it's a station in which we assure the change on the same platform. So you arrive with the train and you have the other one who waits for you on the other um, on the other track. But this is not a real question in this case because normally in network maps you don't have this kind of information. So we just tried in uh, in one of the seven conditions to modify the the form of the Juvisy station and to make it bigger. If it's bigger, this was the, the question we had, maybe people choose to change in the other one because it looks smaller. But in the two cases, you have not uh, tried to do it. So you try to have a sort of limited rationality choice. You think the station is smaller because the representation is smaller. And on the small data we have, it seems confirmed. But I cannot say it now for sure, because we have to uh, accumulate more, more data. And so this leads me to the final question, which I was about to ask. So you mentioned in your presentation uh, an almost complete inability for field experts, uh, including public transport experts, to predict the result of objective, objective performance measurements. So I was just wondering, uh, based on this uh, this uh, statement and based on your study, uh, do you think that uh, we uh, currently, the industry of transport planning is getting the human behavior wrong and do you think that uh, the procedures and the outputs of the uh, ridership predictions, ridership uh, modeling on uh, complex public transport networks make no sense as of now? I will not drive so far. What, what the, can I say is that probably we have all a sort of naive vision of human behavior. And we all made very complex choice. And we are today unable to predict uh, in a precise manner the reaction that people would have when we applied some kind of modification on our models and our services. So I think that the importance today is to work on understand human behavior related to transport, to have more uh, precise models. So we're not so far from the reality. In a, if we take a complex dimension, a global one, it works. But if we want to go and model this kind of elements, Today, we are not able to do that because we made it here in the south of Paris, but you have other uh, work in Washington, in London, Berlin, and the results are different between the one and the other. So I think that these differences are explainable by telling that people will not act the same way and solution are not today universal. We have not found the uh, minimal elements, the variables that we can modify to obtain a certain result. So we still have to go further and identify the elements that could be modified to obtain a specific effect. So we are just at the beginning. I came from cognitive science, and I can say that, for example, we knew so many things 
about the brain, that the situation today in cognitive science is the same that physicians knew something like 100,000 years ago. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much for this answer and just to add to what you said. Uh, I think transport planning is a multidisciplinary field. I think we need more people from different backgrounds outside transport engineering. And it's great that we have some people in the industry who are coming from cognitive sciences. Thank you very much for this comment. This is really great. Thanks again for the presentation. Um, this is really fascinating to me because I'm looking at it thinking that normally the point of a map is to make sense of the service pattern and to communicate that in a clear and easily understandable way to, to users. In situations such as this where the service pattern is that complicated and there are so many different options for uh, influencing behavior, was any consideration given just to simply saying, okay, let's not call it RERD anymore, let's rename it. And I'm actually probably thinking more of RERC because that's far more complicated than uh, RERD. It should be three or four lines rather than just one. Yes, I, I just, I will tell you two different things. The first one that I arrived at SNCF in 2009 to make a, a PhD about synergy systems. And the person who hired me asked me on the first meeting we had, could you please help us simplify the representation of line C? I don't know if you know line C, but if you didn't know line C, please go outside, find the network maps, and look at line C. Line C, it's a line of 420 kilometers with 86 different stations, and line C goes north, south, east, and west. And sometimes you can go north, coming back to south, and arrive at a station, Versailles Chateau, which is at three kilometers from Versailles Chantier, in which you will arrive after a travel of 45 minutes in the east, then south, and then west. So. Uh, coming from university, I made probably uh, an answer that I would not have made if my history was uh, the one of a company. And I said, well, the easiest way probably will be to cut line in three or four different lines. Mm -hmm. So the things you have here, it's a beginning probably for that, because we decided to cut effectively the south of the line from the north part of the line to uh, control disruptions. But effectively, today, this would be uh, a line which his own lives and the other one too. So, probably in great uh, and complex networks, when I show you the results of the work of uh, Galotti, uh, Porter, and Barthélemy, and they saw that today complex networks are beyond cognitive capacities. Probably we have to simplify it so as they could be managed by people. So I think it's an option to be taken into consideration during next years, uh, in particular in, in Paris, in which we'll have four new lines uh, of metros. And I think that the actual representation I, I chosen <coughs> this version, this is the simplified version, you have not the bus. But I think that you can find a sort of feeling of complexity. You just have to add uh, another line, a second one, a third one, and a fourth one. So probably will not be better than today. And I think that probably we have to eliminate something so as people could use it for the real usage of network maps. So identify, manage a territory and the network. If the network is too complex, it will not work. And so we have probably to uh, think to different uh, tools, with interactive tools, with planification tools, with generic uh, schematic tools to appropriate the, the region. And I think this, this could be uh, an answer 
to, uh, to your question. Simplify the lines, simplify operation, and simplifying tools, eventually creating new tools. No one else? Oh. Thank you. I would like to to provoke a decrease of line A by drawing it like a snake, you know, so that. <clears throat> but uh, its efficiency has uh, has made uh, the line uh, carry 1.2 million passengers per day. So I'm sure that um, this study highlights what can be done with graphics, but that. Passengers are really clever comp uh, taking this data and also their conditions of transport. So one idea is really to to change the naming of the the branch because and it happened in 1967 on line seven because the seven bis because the I think the English speaking persons uh, are searching what is bis like b so it's it, it comes from the Latin bis ter quater and so. So it was created because the two branches were so different in, in ridership that it was uh, more efficient to cut it and to, to, to ask our passengers to do the job to walk from one train to another. So this was only an observation, but what I'm thinking uh, is that um, it's about when you show, we have shown the, the global map of Ile-de-France Yesterday, when I was uh, sharing uh, some moments with others, I have shown the, the Tokyo total map, you know, not with JR, not with Tokyo Metro, not with Toei, but with the 20 operators. So it's an artwork, but it's not usable. So there is a, um, a theoretical study to do. Um, if we want to show all, it's not usable. So it means that we have to be more clever in sharing the roles of the media. If we want to show all, it's for our public relation, but not for use. If you want, I, uh, uh, if we want uh, the whole network to be used, uh, we have to now to, to, to go towards the digital solutions because it will present only the part of the network will be useful for the for the people after <laughs> the procedure of asking the good question this is not a problem but um, we can keep the the network maps for the for the for the bosses for for the to show that paris is and greater paris is fantastic compared to other cities but for the use we must be realistic it's really difficult to to show the uh, everything uh, for the people who want to to see i will search the the global tokyo map uh, on my computer it's fantastic it's, it's really <laughs> impos <laughs> impossible to use well, i think i re not really have to answer i, I think i share with you the, this preoccupation and for tools for travelers uh, for me, the, the main point is the users. So if the efficacy is there, it's a good tool. Otherwise, it's another thing. It's another tool to make different things. So this was the reason for which I was speaking about multiplying uh, tools and have a tool for every use that people could, uh, could have. And obviously, we, we have to try to build coherent tools but i think it's real we cannot ask to uh, a piece of paper to uh, resolve all the problem of transport operators and authorities uh, in paris it's maybe too much for uh, some rest of paper <laughs> anyone else no all right well thank you very much thank you